Hey, we're working. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and uh, it's uh, great to be here. There's a, a wide, wide range of people. So if I uh, let me apologise if I don't uh, look at you all directly while I'm speaking. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about immune disease and the microbiome and PPPM healthcare in response to new knowledge. So what microbiome am I talking about? Am I talking about the normal microbiome you read about in the newspapers? No, I'm interested in this microbiome. The microbiome throughout all of the organs and tissues of the human body. Each organ and tissue has a completely different mi microbiome from other organs and tissues in the body. And it's the balance that's set up during life that determines whether or not we end up sick or we end up healthy. Man is a superorganism with over a hundred million, uh, yes, it says one million on the slide, but the, the current estimates are somewhere around a hundred million microbial genes. So where do, the, the, where do these microbes come from? Well, firstly, you're born with them. Babies are born dirty with a complete set of uh, bacteria. The work with Dave Rollman's group at Stanford showed that um, there are a lot of bacteria which, uh, sampled, which he sampled at two days. And then you can see on the right-hand graph that uh, the, the change in the bacteria balance uh, between two and 14 days of life is relatively minimal from uh, six to seven. So uh, that is because most of the microbes were there at birth. And then we get microbes from our mother, the human breast milk micro microbiome is a very interesting microbiome. This uh, is a, uh, a plot of the um, species organized on an XY basis so that you can uh, see different species at different parts of the plot. And uh, normal mother's milk uh, with a uh, standard vaginal delivery is at the bottom right there. Um, that's the species. But the species that come from a caesarean section delivery are quite different. And they're at the top, uh, middle top of the, the, the graph. So the, the, the milk that the mother puts out is very dependent upon the type of delivery. Now all of these factors, all of these environmental factors that work together to uh, select our microbiome as we move through life. Also our microbiome grows from our environment. We get microbes from our pets, from our family, and our friends. And incidentally, the baby, most of the change in microbes was due to the surrounding family. We get them from travel, food, and medicine. I've got Yehuda Schoenfeld there, who's been uh, um, highlighting recently the uh, vaccine uh, issues. You also get uh, organisms from the air you breathe. On the left you can see San Diego Indoor Hospital. These, uh, this data was sampled by uh, uh, J. Craig Venter. And uh, you can see that 85%, 86% in the hospital of the air, of the DNA in the air, is bacterial. Um, surprisingly, inside a house, a normal house in San Diego, the air they sampled there was about the same, 85% bacterial content. Uh, human was very, very small indeed, 5%, 8% in the, the two cases. And the, unga, the other DNA made up of insects, rodents, fungi, etc. So how do these bacteria live? We've got an immune system that uh, is supposed to protect us, right? So, so how do these bacteria live? Well, they're very clever. That's the best explanation I could give. They're very clever. <coughs> they evade the immune system by actually evading phagocytosis. This is uh, an article from The Scientist which points to a paper in PLOS Pathogens uh, that you can look up. And it shows how E. coli can infect macrophages by evading phagocytosis. As the macrophage engulfs the uh, microbe, the uh, microbe is not killed. The microbe remains viable in a cell wall deficient form um, and uh, then is able to stay as a phagosome, as a viable phagosome uh, or perhaps we would see it as a vacuole when we look through the microscope. Um, this is uh, fluorescent highlighted of course so that you can see the, 
uh, spots inside the, uh, the macrophage. And once they're inside the macrophage, they're fine there as long as that macrophage remains viable, which is quite a long time, typically over a month. So in order for, and, um, in order for the bacteria to survive inside the human phagocytic cells, they have to knock out part of the function of the phagocytic cell that would otherwise kill them. And a key factor is a nuclear receptor called the VDR. <clears throat> the VDR nuclear receptor is a type 1 nuclear receptor that in Homo sapiens is responsible for generating TLR2 as well as cathelicidin, beta defensin, and to a secondary extent alpha defensins as well. Key antimicrobial defenses at the cellular level. And if those defenses are knocked out, then the microbes have a much better chance of survival. So it's no surprise, all of the really successful pathogens knock out that VDR very effectively. And uh, this is a graph which shows the downregulation um, of the VDR for, uh, by a factor of about tenfold um, over a period of one and a half years in lymphoblastoid cell lines, which of course are in the bone and which is where the, uh, the uh, immune cells are, uh, are initially generated. So the species that are known, that have been shown to knock down VDR expression, include EBV, of course, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Aspergillus, Borrelia, Chlamydia, uh, HCV, CMV, and EBV, and all very nasty uh, bugs. And of course, other species do it as well. We just haven't shown that yet. So the VDR is a very important uh, host defense mechanism. What can we do about this? Well, if, if we hypothesize that disease, chronic disease is caused by the microbiome, the correct approach is to use immunostimulation to try and vi revitalize the immune system so that each cell can uh, knock out those microbes rather than the immunosuppression that we typically use uh, in chronic disease. It's important to understand that inflammation is a body's healing response. It's not by itself something inherently bad which needs to be suppressed. We don't need to suppress inflammation, although the patient will suffer from the inflammation if we don't. The, if you give immunostimulative therapy, you are aiming at a long-term successful outcome rather than short-term palliation. And we were lucky enough to hit upon a drug which did in fact activate the VDR. It's a drug that was already approved, um, Olmosartan, it's now generic, and it was approved as an angiotensin II receptor blocker. And the graph at the bottom shows the normal dosing in green, one pulse per day, whereas when we give four or six hourly pulsing, you get a gradual build-up of the concentration in the plasma, as you can see with the red graph there at the bottom. And what that enables the VDR to do is to uh, recommence transcription of those um, uh, antimicrobials and gradually work on the, uh, the microbes. It doesn't happen overnight. It usually takes as much as 18 months before a patient knows that they're going to be fine. So the, the one thing that we found, um, I was working with a number of clinical centres uh, all around the world. Um, you can find reports from some of my other clinical um, collaborators uh, on our YouTube channel at presentations they've given at conferences. Um, but this is a post that was given uh, a couple of months ago by uh, Trudy Heil up in um, St. Petersburg. Well, actually, it was 2015. It seems like just yesterday. Uh, at a conference in St. Petersburg. This is a poster on 62 patients, 62 patients that she treated with... Uh, Omosartan medoxamil as a, an immunostimulative therapy. And it's a funny looking chart because there are a whole lot of <laughs> circles there and uh, we have various diseases written around the outside of the circle and then lines between those diseases. We call it a comorbidity wheel. And here it is, uh, this is taken from one of our recent publications, Discovery Medicine, and you can see the journal decided to put the comorbidity wheel on their front cover, which made us feel very warm. <laughs> um, but the comorbidity wheel is very important because 
it shows that uh, when you're dealing with chronic disease, you rarely find a single chronic diagnosis that is appearing alone. I've got a yellow arrow down the bottom left pointing at diabetes, and the uh, trajectory from there goes to uh, hypertension up on the left, uh, to rheumatoid arthritis up in the top, uh, and um, those are the only arrows I've got, but it also goes to asthma, um, ankylosing spondylitis, and a number of other associated diseases. In other words, these are the diseases that you usually find clustered together uh, in a patient. And this brought us to a new way of thinking about chronic disease. We think about chronic disease as a spectrum of syndromes, a spectrum of symptoms, if you like. Some people have different groups of those, those symptoms and different levels of dysfunction, but it's all part of the one problem. And uh, when people's um, rheumatoid arthritis resolves, quite often their fibromyalgia pain resolves, um, their uh, asthma, which is a minor problem for them at that point typically, um, their hypertension resolves, and of course um, the uh, other things like metabolic syndrome. So a couple of years ago I wrote a paper for um, State University of St. Petersburg, Vesnik, uh, St. Petersburg University on the science of safety. Is it realistic to expect medicine to change to a science base from its evidence base? And what I was looking at was an effort which was uh, launched by the previous FDA commissioner to uh, try and create a science of safety within the FDA. It was a total failure. His staff laughed at him. I heard him, them laughing at him from the back of the room. Um, the concept that science had anything to offer uh, in, uh, in a regulatory FDA type environment. For them, evidence base was everything and all there was. And the problem with that is that science makes advances very often by giving answers that you do not want. Science tells you uncomfortable truths, but you have to follow it. And if medicine is going to make the breakthroughs that we need, we have to start thinking a lot more about science. So let's look at some of the breakthroughs that we need. This is graph, uh, this is the PPPM graph from uh, the CDC in the USA. And it shows the incidence of um, uh, diabetes, both types, from 1960 through to 2050. 1960 through the current day and projected out to 2050. And as you can see, we really haven't made any uh, great strides against diabetes in all that time, right back to 1960. I'm particularly interested in this because this is a photo of me uh, on sabbatical with the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto back in 1982. Toronto, of course, was the leading diabetes research group at that time. And uh, there were a whole lot of multinationals there um, with me studying diabetes. And we were particularly interested in dosing of diabetes and, and finding uh, formulae that uh, uh, people could use uh, run in calculators in order to, uh, to better balance their uh, blood glucose levels with insulin. And that was 1982. I've drawn 1982 on the graph there. And here we are 34 years later, 2016. And I find we still use insulin to control blood glucose. The insulins are basically the same as they were in 1982. We still, we still rely on glycosylated hemoglobin as the primary marker. And the patients still have to guess their insulin dosage. And sure, there have been minor changes, there, uh, particularly in type 2. There have been some improvement. But really, fundamentally, nothing much has improved. Uh, in 34 years of trying to understand diabetes. And I have to say that's a failure. It is my failure. We, when we started out in 82, our goal was to cure diabetes. At that time, a scientist, a physician, always started out with the aim to cure. We lost the goal of cure uh, in the 1980s and 1990s particularly. And then in 2003, the NIH dropped cure totally from the vocabulary. But, you know, cure is what PPPM is all about. Knowledge and cure. 
There is new knowledge. For about a decade, Tony, Tony Lamb's group at Toronto has been working on how a healthy body controls the blood glucose. And they found that the brain controls the blood glucose via the vagus nerve without changing the insulin levels in the body. The brain uses other hormones, ghrelin, uh, CCK, signaling agents, a number of them. And you could look it up in this paper, Hormonal Signaling in the Gut uh, by Cote et al. It's a wonderful paper and it totally sets, in my mind, sets the uh, knowledge that we think we have about diabetes on its head. Additionally, Prof Rubino at King's College London, there on the left at the bottom, has been doing bariatric surgeries where he's <coughs> managed to reverse type 1 diabetes in a certain fraction of patients. And there's a, an article in The Lancet that you can read to find out more about what he's doing. And then uh, Nora Volkoff from um, the NIH, the US NIH, published in 2011, five years ago, that uh, she found in her lab using PET, positron emission tomography uh, signaling, that cell phones had an effect on brain glucose metabolism as well and profoundly changed brain glucose metabolism. And with the proliferation of cell phones and cell towers recently, you think that somebody would be researching and following up that NIH lead, but no. I looked at the European Association for the Study of Diabetes a conference that was held two weeks ago, huge conference in Munich. I looked at every paper. There wasn't one paper looking at either of those two topics uh, of scientific advances in diabetes. It's just amazing. We've got to try and get science back into um, into uh, medicine. So we have been doing our own work on uh, electrosmog rather than phones because it's a bigger problem than phones. Electrosmog and autoimmune disease. And um, we were getting a, a higher rate of failure in our uh, patients. We're getting a 10 to 20 percent uh, rate of slow responders uh, over the last five years. We couldn't really figure out why. And uh, we put together some, um, rather, rather than telling people to hold cell phones to their heads and see if they feel worse or better, which is the average way that these tests are held, that's a stupid thing. It's a stupid test. But what we did was we put together some, some hoods to be worn uh, in sleep. Sleeping hoods. If they're claustrophobic, they can pop it up a bit. <laughs> but basically sleeping hoods. And these are woven from silver fibres. They have normal fabric and inside the normal fabric, silver fibres are wo woven and it keeps the waves away from the brain. And we thought, well, let, let's see whether um, how many are, high, uh, are sensitive. Uh, normally about 3% of the population is regarded as being uh, electro-hypersensitive. And um, we were amazed when we got the results. When we got the results, we found that 90% of them reported that there was a significant change in their symptoms when they just used a minor shield against electrosmog. This is a factor we have to do research in. This is a type of thing that PPM will absolutely rely on to produce the uh, prevention that we have to prevent to, to stop that graph going up and start it plateauing and moving down again. And this is a paper we published recently which gives some details not only of that uh, little experiment with the hats but also explains how the waves actually affect each of the molecules. Um, that's supposed to be a movie down there, it's not, but molecules are moving all the time and that's how the waves interact with them. They break the hydrogen bonds. Uh, they break the hydrogen bonds in DNA when they're strong enough, but they break the hydrogen bonds in normal proteins, even at very, very low signal levels altogether. So how much electrosmog has there been since the start of our graph in 1960? Well, in 1960, Sputnik had just gone up. 1957 was Sputnik 1. So that puts it roughly into perspective. Very, very early days in uh, radio frequency uh, research. 
And the Naval Research Laboratory very conveniently did a graph, a very thorough graph, of electrosmog uh, in various parts of the Earth's uh, surface. And when we take that graph of electrosmog from 1961 and I compare it with what we have today, we have 50,000 times greater electrosmog today than we had in 1960. That's a factor we should be researching if we want to be predictive and preventative in our medicine. So I'll finish now with um, uh, a little bit of uh, commentary. This is a press release from the World Health Organization and it reports that deaths from non-communicable diseases are on the rise with the developing world hit hardest. Now when they talk about non-communicable diseases, they're talking about cardiovascular disease, autoimmune diseases. I don't know why they called it non-communicable. The science says that uh, you get clusters in family of some of these chronic diseases. Sarcoidosis is very well, and, and other diseases as well. So why did anyone call it non-communicable? That's not science. That's a political uh, decision. That's one of the problems that we have to deal with as we move forward to a PPPM world. In fact, it may not be possible for true PPPM breakthroughs without fundamental changes to existing models of healthcare, like WHO, medicine, which really isn't adopting as much science as, as it should be right now. And scientists, scientists are doing a terrible job. I spoke to a, a pharmacologist or a, a drug designer in San Diego um, a couple of years ago, and he'd been 21 years in the industry and designed three drugs that were on the market. And I said to him, well, what do the patients think of your drugs? And he had not spoken to one patient who had used his drugs in 21 years, there is so much separation of science and medicine. The IRBs foster separation. And that is not conducive to proper scientific approach in PPPM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Two questions. Yeah, can I have a question? Trevor. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Omezartan is the uh, ungeared tension receptor inhibitor, so it's an hypertensive medicine which uh, patients around the world take once daily throughout their whole life. Do yes. they have the uh, restored innate immune system or not? No. no. They have it restored for a short time. But uh, the graph on my third or fourth slide, and I'll, I can send you a copy of my slides, and uh, we'll put a link to them from the YouTube presentation because I'll try and put this up on YouTube. Um, but the, um, the graph shows a single peak 20 foot once every 24 hours, whereas when you put, dose it every four to six hours, you gradually build up a basal level. Okay, you've got the pulses, but you're building a basal level. And that's important because the nuclear receptors uh, have a cyclical rhythm. The nuclear receptors work in a four hour to 12 hour rhythm. Um, and so yes, one of those rhythm cycles might be affected by the drug, but not the next. Now, I, I do need to point out, Olmosartan is absolutely unique. You cannot use any other angiotensin receptor blocker. Each of them has different properties in the VDR. Um, but angiotensin is absolutely unique. It just happens to do this. It's a generic drug now, as of now. <laughs> Uh, today or tomorrow, and um, and it's a very interesting drug that we need to uh, study more. It is actually not a very good hypertensive. The head of the FDA uh, cardiovascular division that approved that uh, drug said that uh, they found that given to some patients has actually raised their blood pressure. That's because it's fiddling with the immune system as well, you know. Uh, but they don't look, that the, the evidence-based science didn't pick that out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.